The year is 1997. I am 14 years old and an avid listener of Emerson College Radio's legendary hip-hop show, 88.9 at Night, which exposes my young mind to a litany of underground rap on a nightly basis. With a fresh copy of Sound Bombing 2 loaded into my trusty shockwave, I adorn myself in the most affordable of rimless sunglasses, grab my pack of clove cigarettes, and board the 73 bus to Harvard Square. From there, I will skate down to Strawberries on Memorial Drive and stand in line to purchase tickets to the Warp Tour at the Three County Fairgrounds in Northampton, Massachusetts. Headlined by Blink-182 and Limp Biscuit, the show featured incredible performances by Pennywise, Lagwagon, Real Big Fish, The Mighty Mighty Bostones, and somewhere in between, a relatively unknown Eminem the lineup's only hip-hop artist. From there, the seed was planted, not just in my mind, but the minds of countless suburban music fans who were growing tired of black artists talking about their own prosperity instead of glorifying their continued struggle. Listen, Just Don't Give a Fuck and Any Man are classic hip-hop songs. Stan and The Way I Am are very thought-provoking tracks. His recent collab with Dr. Dre, Gospel, is an instant classic in my book. But Eight Mile Battles didn't make Marshall Mathers' career, nor did Dr. Dre. Angsty white kids like me did. Eminem's creativity is based in a deep appreciation of hip-hop culture. That appreciation is then used to make pop music that is palatable to casual white audiences and corporations who profit off of ignorance and inequality. As we've stated before, America has always been a right-wing country whose only goal is capitalist expansion through violence. If you feature violence in your work, it will often garner attention. Now, there are many ways one could use this trope to make a point about the culture we live in, thus following in the footsteps of the artists Eminem claims to be influenced by. Can you imagine somebody having 32 million dollars? 32! 32 million dollars! And this person has nothing? And you can sleep? Hip-hop has always been about highlighting and confronting the systems that oppress black people. Becoming the dominant cultural influence on the planet is in itself an act of revolutionary anti-racism. Marshall Mathers' response to this 40-year musical protest is... I felt like, I, you know, I'm being attacked for this reason or that reason, and I gotta fight my way through this. Eminem's politics are not all that far off from Joe Rogan's. Change my mind. But hey, amongst the dozens of songs about domestic abuse and drug addiction that single-handedly shifted the narrative of an entire genre, you can occasionally find edgy, pseudo-political anthems that skewer popular right-wingers. In this video, we will break down Mr. Mather's various attempts to tap into the higher infinite power helping oppressed people and reflect on his true impact as an ally over the past two and a half decades. Starting with this nonsense. In our recent video about Janet Jackson's revolutionary album, Rhythm Nation 1814, which no one has watched, but I don't care, I made that one for me, we discussed how public announcements of non-racism have always been a staple of white American culture. Throughout his career, Eminem has been applauded for taking the mildest of progressive stances, pulling on the thin heartstrings of ignorant liberals everywhere with vague anti-war sentiments and multisyllabic Michael Scott-esque declarations of America bad. The culmination of caucasity came to us via Super Bowl 56, where Eminem took a paycheck from and then politely bargained with a group of old white men who own black people so they'd let him squeeze in a quick tribute to a player that was openly blacklisted by said organization. Not a protest, a tribute to a protest. Colin Kaepernick sacrificed his entire life and career to make an ongoing public statement about racism in the United States and did it with his head held high the whole time. If he lowered his head at all, it was because he was tired from kneeling so much. This is how someone with a spine engages in nonviolent protest. This is somewhere between bowing to your master and curling up in a ball in fear. Get him. He's practically in the fetal position. It is the most submissive pose one could take in that situation, and a fraction of what Colin did. Someone on TikTok said to me that Eminem didn't want to upstage the other black artists up there. And I get that. But in my experience, a white person physically putting their body between black people and racists is usually taken in good faith during a protest. But again, this wasn't a protest. It was a tribute to a protest. So, what do you do when you work for modern slave owners, but still want to portray an image of personal non-racism? Well, besides completely ignoring systemic issues, 
or attempting to develop and share any sort of class consciousness through your art, you're going to want to find someone that is known for being divisive and use them as a scapegoat for society's problems. Sound familiar? Ground floor, Mr. Mathers. Welcome to White America. Okay, quick thought experiment for the black people in the audience. Uh, you're at a civil rights demonstration of some kind, and a white person dressed like this shows up and says they're down for the cause. What do you do? White America is the second song on 2002's The Eminem Show and details his strange relationship with the American majority after quickly invoking his First Amendment rights. The women and men who have broke their necks for the freedom of speech, the United States government has sworn to uphold. I want everybody to listen to the words so of the song. Told. He describes the army of people who, quote, share the same views and same exact beliefs as him. Mind you that up until this point, 100% of his songs were about assault, substance abuse, and being an overall shitty person for comedic effect. Now, here's the thing. We all know that offensive subject matter and even vivid fantasy can be cathartic aspects of musical expression. I am not making this video to cancel Eminem for his problematic lyrics. We also know that conservatives love to target raunchy and aggressive artists for their effect on the youth, while engaging in these very same activities behind closed doors. The long list of family values touting politicians involved in sex scandals is well known. But at the same time, the right encourages violence and selfishness, and benefits from the individualistic fuck-the-world perspective. Eminem's music is more prevalent amongst the military, police, and fitness industry than anywhere else. A song with this bold of a title could have been about that blatant hypocrisy, or maybe about how Americans fall in love with toxic white guys, but are quick to scream about cultural depravity when a black person even remotely steps out of line. But no. Somehow, Marshall is confused as to why a walking metaphor for white supremacy who promotes excessive pharmaceutical drug use and a 1950s attitude towards gay people and women is so popular. It's probably because he says what he thinks without a filter, and it just bothers the normies. Uh, no, no, seriously, that's just what this song is about. In verse 2, Shady infamously admits, If I was black, I would have sold half. As true as this is, it's not a recognition of systemic racism, but a nod to his racial privilege. Centering his own experience, he goes out of his way to talk about how his whiteness is a disadvantage in underground hip-hop, until it isn't. Because we can see here, and here, and here that he is well aware of how his whiteness is an advantage. Okay, I'm, I'm just really lost as to what the point of this song is. Instead of making racial injustice the focus of his art, Eminem decides to write about his own perceived oppression within a minority community that is desperately seeking autonomy from White America! So you humbled yourself, studied, learned their ways, and when you earned their trust, you took over. Sound familiar? In the third and final verse, which is honestly challenging to get to after multiple instances of that awful chorus, Eminem finally tells us what the real problem is, that his access to white suburban youth, an audience he admittedly accessed by adhering to racist standards, is causing activists to put his lyrics under a microscope. To close it out, Slim drops this choice bar. Acting like I'm the first rapper to smack a bitch of safety got shit. Okay. I just realized that this song is not even about right-wingers. It's a fuck you to people who don't like murder porn, and SJWs like me who suggest that satire, by definition, is supposed to have some sort of message that transcends the behaviors and events being described. Eminem could be doing what N.W.A. and Biggie and Tupac did and say, yeah, I'm a bad person who does bad things. And that's because the world I live in is designed by those in power to be violent and chaotic. And that's bad. All right, before all the enlightened centrists click off this video, I'm gonna do a quick impression of them having a temper tantrum into their phone in response to what I just said. It's just a song, Snowflake. Rappers talk about violence all the time. He just took it to the next level. It's just words. Toughen up, bucko. In 2004's Like Toy Soldiers, Eminem talks about the pressure to live up to the aggressive persona he embodies in his music, and how insensitive words that get tossed around in rap often lead to real-world consequences. For him. Just for him. Again, this track would be an excellent opportunity to discuss the media and its insatiable desire for celebrity drama, how it deviously pits artists against each other for profit, most notably contributing to the deaths of hip-hop's two biggest stars or just about how violence is glorified in the media in general. 
or take it in another direction. Make it an anti-war anthem that speaks to the plight of all the poor young white kids who join the military due to lack of options. Nope. We get two excruciating first draft verses where M takes us on a roller coaster of egomaniacal emotions that attempt to justify his beefs with Ja Rule and former owner of the Source magazine, Benzino. Who do you think race is sided with in those battles, hmm? Also, in this eerily prescient video, Proof, a founding member of D12 and lifelong friend of Mathers, is murdered. Two years later, the Shady Records hype man would be shot multiple times over a dispute at a Detroit pool hall. That's it? I thought this was the one with all the Bush criticism. Oh wait, how about this one? All right, this sounds better. Says here that We As Americans was pulled from the original release of the album, as it threatens the president. But he doesn't specify which president, so nothing ended up happening. And the rest of the song is about Eminem's personal Second Amendment right to bear arms, which was taken away after he pistol whipped a guy who allegedly made out with his wife. I mean, I'm all for responsible gun ownership, but uh, this is not an example of that. Okay, 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 okay. On Mosh, Slim Shady finally gets serious about his views on the government. It's just all in your mind, what you interpret it as. I say to fight, you take it as I'ma whip someone's ass. Here, we have a great call to nonviolent direct action, and an example of how Eminem could be using his hyperbolic speech patterns for good. From there, he goes on to ramble about his successful entrepreneurial endeavors, and after a lot of vague revolutionary pandering, we eventually get some actual political rhetoric. Stomp, push, shove, mush, fuck, push, until they bring our troops home, come on! At the time, the intentions of the song were clear. Mosh would be released as a single on October 26th, 2004, just days before the presidential election between George W. Bush and John Kerry. But not unlike his timid Neil, the words fuck Bush kind of get lost in a sea of rhymes that all sound very similar. And the punchline ends up not really making as much of an impact as it should. Like, come on, say it with your chest, man. George Bush doesn't care about black people. In the third verse, he gets a bit more specific. He's against the war in Afghanistan. But that's not all, folks. With calls to start God-fueled mosh pits outside the Oval Office, yikes. He demands that the president, quote, answer to a higher anarchy, which includes Bush himself taking up arms and literally fighting his own battles. Okay, I'll fucks with you. Shit, I'll fucks with you too. So instead of fighting a war on the other side of the planet for oil, what should we be doing? We got our own battles to fight on our own soil. No more psychological warfare to trick us to thinking that we ain't loyal. Battles like maybe poverty or the ability for all people to live as they see fit without judgment. Uh, what are we talking about here? With only one obscure mention to the president he's referring to, it's way too easy to recontextualize huge portions of these lyrics to be about any American authority figure on either side of the aisle. Now you realize I have all this power. I can move it to the left, I can maneuver it to the right. Marshall can't even muster up the courage to condemn the military industrial complex or Wall Street. Shit, as far as battle raps go, it barely goes after its target, spending most of the track hyping up a theoretical crowd of protesters, I guess? Is that what you call this? Oh yeah, lest we forget this extra cringy part at the end where he makes his daughter spout some more fake woke gibberish. It's great that you're not afraid to take a stand, but what do you actually stand for? The release of 2004's Encore led to a five-year hiatus for the MC, which included bouts of drug addiction, a reconnection with his estranged wife Kim, and the aforementioned passing of his best friend to gun violence. Returning with possibly his worst album to date, 2009's Relapse had Eminem immediately scrambling to recover. And he did. Despicable is probably my favorite Eminem freestyle. A return to his battle roots, he introduces a brand new, rapid-fire flow over Drake's Over and Lloyd Banks's Beamer Benz or Bentley. Oh, that beat flip. I can still just read these lyrics and get chills. Okay, I'm gonna do my best Fantano impersonation. Uh, keep blogging while I mind boggle, and I zone like I'm in the twilight, dog. Get off my bone. This is my mic, doggone it. I like hogging it. Flows so wet, I'ma take this beat tobogganin'. I'm waterlogging it. I'm sogging it. Like, come on. So, yeah, there's an F slur in there. But otherwise, Eminem comes so correct on this song. 
Gone are the bars about fake celebrities, savvy business endeavors, and tumultuous relationships. In the age of Macklemore, Mac Miller, and MGK, Marshall Mathers steps up, claims the title of best white rapper, and promptly drops the mic. Wait a second, wasn't that last part supposed to be about the song Not Afraid? Yeah, so uh, Not Afraid is yet another song where Eminem baits his audience into thinking he stands for something, but ends up spending the entire track discussing his own egotistical struggles and failures. Recently, Not Afraid has been used by performative white allies on TikTok in the name of Black Lives Matter, which to them means catching a nice buzz during the Super Bowl, throwing the old front-facing camera on, and curling up in a little ball of their own in the living room. With Recovery producing a handful of hit singles, the most popular horrorcore artist of all time would find himself leaning on the talents of Sia, Rihanna, and Skylar Grey to stay on the charts. Smash cut to 2017, the PSYOP commonly known as the Obama administration had done its job of funneling trillions of taxpayer dollars to major corporations and radicalizing quiet racists while not passing any remotely progressive policies. Suddenly America's like the biggest oil producer and the biggest guy. Uh, that was me. Anyway, with Trump in office, Eminem drops The Storm, a four and a half minute freestyle directed at the celebrity turned president. Throughout the acapella, he misses many opportunities to discuss larger systemic issues, instead resorting to making fun of an old man's physical appearance and doing impressions of ignorant Southerners. As a person of his color to represent us. When Redman says us, he of course means all black people. But the thing is, the only black people Eminem is influenced by are black men who are tired of not being allowed to fully engage in American capitalism by white men. The legendary funk doctor Spock then goes on to say that white rappers often avoid talking about the racism they know their black counterparts experience on a daily basis. Revival would return to these themes in greater detail, but because I don't want to subject you or myself to this terrible album again, Light to. we'll be referencing this 2017 Billboard article that highlights some of Eminem's political bars. This first quote comes from the song Untouchable, a song in which Eminem unironically takes on the role of a racist white cop for the first two verses. And in the third verse, takes the perspective of a black person in like an absurdly tone-deaf reboot of Joyner Lucas's I'm Not Racist? It's, it's not good. No. If you can make it to that third verse, you will find some of Slim Shady's wokest bars to date. In a country that claims that its foundation was based on United States ideals that had its natives killed, got you singing this star-spangled spiel to a piece of cloth that represents a land of the free that made people slaves to build. Hey, not bad. But this is really just geared at the loud and proud Murica types. Again, an easy target. How about bringing up the $42 trillion in lost wages and potential profits African people have lost over the past few centuries? Okay, I just realized he does not actually say the words Black Lives Matter in any of these songs. Not once. Fuck your Republican views, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, what a fuck are the boots? Okay, yeah, uh, totally agreed here. But are Republicans the only ones promoting bootstrap theory? Isn't Eminem's whole story about pulling yourself up from your bootstraps? Also, have you heard this guy talk? Look, I'm a capitalist. He could wipe student debt clean with one signature, literally allowing millions of people greater access to the free market. But the interest on decades of predatory loans makes an incredible amount of money for the capitalist government. Oh, we're going to me? Uh, I, I don't have anything for this part. As long as these capitalist endeavors are the priority of the capitalist policymakers in office, we will continue to be bombarded with tired capitalist concepts like bootstrap theory. Why are there black neighborhoods? Cause America segregated us, designated us to an area, separated us. Section 8 of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 was created when Get this, studies showed that the worst problem afflicting low-income people was not substandard housing, but the high percentage of income spent on housing. In 1970, this was a problem. The U.S. government's solution to this was not to raise the federal minimum wage or put a limit on housing prices, but to cap renter contribution to a mere 30 fucking percent of their income and then just pay private landlords the rest of whatever they claim to be owed. 
This was considered progressive for the time. As cost of living goes up, wages stay low, and generational wealth continues to buy up land. Not only do people of color get forced into Section 8 housing, we now have a recipe for a bloated government program that Republicans can now rally against. The competition capitalism creates is between low-income workers and the owner class that manipulates and profits off of their labor. Moving on, Like Home is Eminem's, uh, staunchly pro-American anti-Trump anthem? I don't know, it sounds to me like what Nancy Pelosi uses to hype herself up before a speech. He doesn't actually come out in support of transgender people, but he does disagree with Trump's attempt to ban them from the military. And this song doesn't have any F slurs in it, so yeah. But then, even though he already did this whole charade 15 years ago, he's still a proud American who won't let this one bad apple, quote, ruin our country. Dude, have you ever heard of the Founding Fathers? They were not cool to black people. Someone please explain to me what Eminem actually believes in. Not only that, but when Trump was just your everyday ruthless capitalist who likes to hang out with underage girls and bankrupt small businesses, y'all were best friends. Slim Shady is a winner. What happened? Yeah, so going back to 2004, where Eminem had an hour-long MTV special where he performed some songs and fumbled around trying to do improv as a fake presidential candidate. It featured Carson Daly, 50 Cent, Special Ed, and a glowing endorsement from Donald Trump. It was an absolute mess. Everything Eminem does is to get attention. It does not matter what kind. Let's take a look at his track record. All I ever wanted to do was get respect from you know, my peers and other rappers. Dude, you had that by a landslide in 1999. Then, for some reason, you went and did this. May I have your attention, please? And this. Two trailer park girls go around the outside. And then this. <laughs> and this. Doing, doing, doing. And later, this. Cause my rhymes on the red All the other stuff that came with it, I, I, I was just you know, confusing. These are some of the worst hip hop songs ever made. I'd rather listen to Chingy. M even managed to botch his recent collab with the legendary DJ Premier, putting out this generic trap dud. Why would you do this to me? Especially considering Nas's last few projects, I'm gonna go ahead and crown Eminem as the worst beat picker in hip hop by far. When he's not rapping over bubbly ass Lazy Town instrumentals, his production sounds like a scrapped Dr. Dre rap rock project featuring Aaron Lewis from Stained. Slim Shady has also been accused of borrowing lyrical style and content from Nas, Cage, and fellow Detroit natives ICP and Esham. Redman is admittedly his favorite rapper. You can hear him pay homage to the New Jersey native's flow on their 2000 collab, Off the Wall. I've also always gotten big pheromonge vibes from Eminem. The point I'm trying to make is that Eminem is a fantastic mimic. Dr. Dre has always been the producer to mold the talent around him, from Ice Cube to Snoop Dogg to Scott Storch to 50 Cent. Eminem was a much needed addition to his roster and cemented his legacy as a pop tastemaker in the most traditional sense. I just um, felt like maybe I needed to bump into the right artist or the right musician or whatever, and I didn't have that at the time. Eminem was the missing link. Marshall Mathers has long been touted as the best rapper alive. I have never understood why. Black Thought's 10-minute funk flex demonstration and emceeing is better than anything in Slim's catalog. And his music is way better. Gift of Gab could wrap circles around Eminem and has a longer list of fun songs you can play for people who don't like rap. Brother Ali has a much more interesting backstory and has many introspective and emotional songs about his struggle as a poor white person with albinism. Mac Miller had 10 times more natural swag than Eminem. So does Evidence and Your Old Droog. R.A. the Rugged Man and Ill Bill are better at being assholes. The list of MCs with more to offer goes on and on. But I'm getting off track. The question is, is Eminem a good ally? Uh, no. Die, old bitch, die before I murder you. What do you mean by this, M? Well, first of all, I feel like when I rap, like, people twist my words. I intentionally saved this for the end so we could dissect the man's music without resorting to the common refrain of Eminem hates women and gay people. I get attacked by female journalists a lot, you know what I'm saying? Like, trying to corner me into saying that I'm a misogynist and shit like that, and I'll slap him in the fucking face. I ain't no misogynist, I'll slap a bitch in the face. 
So tell me, is this satire about how many men are abusive monsters that hate women, but get away with it as long as they don't specifically say the words, I hate women? Or, or what here? There's also a very old recording that I'm not going to pull up where M spits a rhyme about not dating black girls. Now, I do think everyone has the right to embarrass themselves as a teenager and have it not affect the rest of their lives. Testing boundaries is an important part of growing up and creating art. However, it does seem like the guy was pulling from real life experiences as someone who lived in a multicultural environment. Guess what? Anti-blackness and ingrained racism is still prevalent in those spaces. As white people in those spaces, it's our responsibility to educate ourselves about those things. Which leads us to the question, where are the black women in Eminem's life today? Or the gay people? When I say things about gay people or people think that my lyrics are homophobic, mm -hmm. you know, it's because I'm gay. Longtime friend and gay icon Elton John has this to say. Nothing. He has absolutely nothing of value to say. I'm more shocked that people haven't figured it out yet. In 2012, Eminem came out in support of gay marriage. Ooh, sorry. Uh, the answer we were looking for is actually gay people, specifically gay men, are not inferior to straight men in any way. But uh, nice try. He also makes it clear that, quote, anything I've ever said, I was certainly feeling at the time, and that his views have matured over the years. In response to his use of gay slurs on 2013's Rap God, he flips the script once again and now says he should be allowed to say whatever he wants because that's how he grew up. Again, he invokes his homophobic upbringing and says he equates the term to bitch or punk, which it turns out are also gay slurs. He goes on to say that if these marginalized groups can't accept his non-hate, he is not willing to update his understanding of things or do any more emotional or mental labor on the subject. It's always reduced to his personal beliefs in relation to the music that he makes. He has no understanding of how he has an effect on White America! In 2018's Fall, yet another one of the worst rap songs ever made, he calls openly bisexual rapper Tyler the Creator the F-slur out of nowhere. It's really awkward. Eminem is better than this. Like, he easily could have written way better lyrics, but chose to do this. I've pretty much just been leaving a breadcrumb trail of gayness. I see that now. We get it. You're not using these words to say, you are a man who is attracted to other men, LOL. You are using a word that means, you are a man who is attracted to other men, to also mean, you are less of a man than I am. And that's objectively not true. Gay men are way more masculine than straight men. I'll prove it. Here, straight man, gay man. When someone tells you that you're being an asshole, a term that actually means a contemptible or detestable person, and your response to this is, well, I'm just used to saying whatever I want with no consequence, do you not see the inherent privilege in that statement? On the other hand, when you actually respect women and gay people, and their perspectives are a part of your everyday life and personal growth, you're not just accepting them into a culture dominated by the race and gender you were born into. You are actually treating them like equals. Because that's your goal, right? Equality? Right? If your music is about playing a character that is openly aggressive towards women and gay people, you are going to attract an audience that is openly aggressive towards women and gay people. It does not matter what you actually believe. Those people will take your music as gospel and not pay attention to what you say in the liberal media. So what is the message that is getting through to so many young people? That of an angry white dude who has gone through just as much shit as anyone else and deserves some respect, goddammit? And if you don't respect me, I'll kill you and th throw you in the trunk of my car? <laughs> what kind of people are buying into this fantasy? Oh yeah, uh, Clipping does super lyrical fantasy horrorcore way better than Eminem. Check them out. Much of Eminem's fan base is overtly racist. The rest believe that all types of people should be welcomed into American culture, as long as they act in a way that is acceptable, which is code for having an interest in capitalism. A system that, if you haven't heard, profits off the continued exploitation of the working class. People who actually speak out against the system are generally not handed millions of dollars every year by corporations that actively own African slave ports. I mean, Rage Against the Machine did it somehow, but that was like 30 years ago. And even they were billed as just generally anti-authoritarian. 
Oh yeah, so this is a map of the current overseas properties of Ballore SE, the French corporation founded in 1822 that has a majority stake in Universal Music Group, which owns Interscope Records, which owns Aftermath Records, which owns Eminem's Shady Records imprint. Along with a record label, there is also the Marshall Mathers Foundation, which has collaborated with Nike, Chrysler, the British Red Cross, and other corporations that manipulate poor people globally to raise money for various causes. This article actually uses his philanthropy to defend the 2020 song Unaccommodating, where he compares himself to a number of different far-right terrorists, including the Manchester bomber, an act of mass murder he himself raised $2 million for. Going back to this 2012 interview, he admits that the murder everyone aesthetic was getting run into the ground. Yet, here he is again, glorifying the Las Vegas shooter. Donald Trump makes money by being an unlikable public figure. I'm Donald Trump, I'm always right. He feeds on negative energy. So does Eminem. That's an awfully hot coffee pot. They might as well have worked together on the 2017 freestyle. It was nothing more than a petty dig at a fellow celebrity. The exact same shit Slim was doing when Trump endorsed him in 2004. Eminem continues to promote fascist ideals of violent, insecure masculinity to a majority white male audience. For money. And that's okay to him, because that's just what hip-hop has always been about. The black art form of hip-hop has violent tendencies because of centuries of racism white people have never had to face. To suggest that black people are inherently violent due to their treatment, as he does on Untouchable, is not doing them any favors either. Marshall Mathers demonstrates the exact kind of white liberal exceptionalism that MLK and Malcolm X warned about. The kind that smugly declares, I gladly accept the presence of black men in American society. My work as an ally is done. Like cops and the military, Eminem is able to normalize and separate himself from the violence he consciously engages in. This is a sign of great trauma, which he wears proudly on his sleeve. White supremacy taught him to do that, as it does to all of us. To go against white supremacy is to listen to fat, disabled, black trans women and adjust your behavior to their needs. That is the most rebellious thing you can do in America. But then you'd have to have a conversation with all of your friends about how homophobia and transphobia and ableism and fatphobia and hypermasculinity and capitalism are all directly tied to the enslavement and genocide of black and indigenous people worldwide. And that would be uncomfortable. Good night and good luck.